Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, and as John Campy always says, your existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, me, Robert Meyer Burnett. And I'm here with another John Campy Show mailbag for Thursday, July 14th, 2022. Now, as you know, during the John Campy Show, we take your questions live. We only open up, open up the Super Chats for a brief moment because we take as many as we can answer on the show because we know you guys want to see your questions answered live. But every other time, 24-7, we have this, the mailbag. And if you go to that link right below, clearly you already knew, because if you're watching this, you probably already sent in a tip with a question, a comment, a review. You can tell us what you think of us uh, anytime, day or night, seven days a week, 24-7. Our operators are standing by. So welcome to the mailbag, and let's jump right into it. We start with our friend Jonathan Namella. Jonathan asks... Here we go. Hello, John, Rob, it's me. Is Marvel trying to grind our gears as audience members with Doctor Strange's girlfriend in the second movie getting married without an explanation? Well, Jonathan, remember, I mean, Stephen Strange was blipped, so he vanished for five years. And at the time, there was, I mean, once the word came out about what was happening or what happened, and the Avengers probably had to explain to the world who Thanos was and what the Infinity Stones were. I would have loved to have seen that press conference. But there was no chance that Doctor Strange was going to be coming back anytime soon, so people moved on with their lives. And, um, you know, that's just that's just what people do. So I don't think they were trying to grind our gears. I think it was just a natural extension of, unfortunately, what happened at the time. Um you know, it was all very unfortunate, and everyone's lives were were disrupted. So I don't think I don't think they were playing, trying to play fast and loose or anything like that with us. I think that's just the way it went. Jonathan goes on and asks, "Hello, John and Rob. I desperately need your help. I'm getting my comic book CGCs. I'm getting my comic book graded, but I don't know how to price CGC comic books. Do you have any recommendations for me? Apps, websites, books, anything that can help me bring on the filthy? Well, Jonathan, great question." For those uh, who don't know what Jonathan is asking, so there's a company called CGC, and you can send your comic books to them, and they look at them and review them and grade them, and they grade them on a numerical scale, and what you want, I mean, if I've never seen a 10.0 comic, but most people want to see that their comics are graded uh, nine and above, and the more, the higher the grade is, the more valuable the books are, and what they do is they then what's called, they do what's called slabbing the books. So they, they put it into a vacuum seal shell, clear plastic shell with a CGC sticker on the top that has the actual rating and you know uh, what the value of the comic is or, or what it's been graded and then the value is determined by that grade. So, you know, if you had like, I don't know, X-Men 94, for instance, and it was graded at 9.8, that's a very valuable comic book. But if it was uh, X-Men 94 that was graded at 5 or 6 or say 6.5, it would be worth a lot less. Now, here's the thing. I think the best place to go, I, there might be apps. I'm, I, I don't use them, so I'm not aware of, of any CGC apps. But the first place I always look is just on eBay and see what, what books have been selling for. And there's places you can look, and it'll tell you when the last CGC graded book of a certain run uh, was sold. You can find out like what the, what the most money it garnered. And you can just research it on the web and find out. Um, but I always start at eBay because everything is there and it's easy to chart. But um, congratulations on getting your books graded. Our friend Garden Variety Vagabond, one of two, is here. Let me bring this down. Uh, team, I'm keeping it vague, but I hated the first half of Love and Thunder until I looked at that portion as a story told by Korg to the children. This was not a direct, true representation of what happened, but a depiction in his children's story. It explains the goofiness of Thor, the bad dialogue of the Guardians, and the fast-forward battle that made no sense. It does not explain many of the later issues, though. You know what, Garden Variety Vagabond? We were talking about this yesterday, uh, and I I, I kind of love this idea. I mean, I, I, I guess I haven't gone back to see Thor again, but I want to. I got to take Elizabeth, and I, I'm going to incorporate this into my head canon. That at some point, and I'm actually going to be looking for the demarcation point. When are we not hearing Korg's story to the kids anymore? 
And I, I love this idea. I think it's great. I mean, I, 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 I've now decided that yes, indeed, that because it's a perfect, it's a perfect, uh, uh, explanation of where all the goofiness came from. I, I really, I really like this idea. Now, you know, again, is it the real thing that's going on? No, maybe not, or maybe it is. I don't know. But I, in my mind, I would think no. But now. Now that I have this way to look at the film, I might like it more because my biggest problem was the silliness. I just thought, why is this so silly? It's too silly for me. But if the idea that it's a children's story, I like that idea. I think it's really, really good. Uh, Jonathan and Nimella comes back and says, hello, John and Rob. About the Mickey Rourke situation, there's only one way to settle this. Mickey Rourke versus Tom Cruise in the main event at WrestleMania 39 for the WWE Championship. Uh, in a Hell in the Cell match. Let's go, Mickey. Let's go, Tom. Ready to rumble. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Bring on the filthy. Jonathan. Now, I, I, I don't know if Tom Cruise would be up for that. But Mickey Rourke, I'm sure he would be. <laughs> It'd be a good fight, too. I, I kind of like this idea. I just, you know, Mickey and Tom, you know, they're they're up there. Tom's in, Tom turned 60. I, I, I would watch that fight. <laughs> I would watch that match. I just would worry about the well-being of both men. <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's a good idea though. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, <laughs> Garden Variety Vagabond says, "Team, now that Odin is dead, who is the head of the Norse pantheon? Now is that Thor? We've seen so few of them." Also, you mentioned about future relationships. Do you think Thor will get with Sif, as in mythology? Garden Variety Vagabond, you are uh, asking good questions. And I, I, as many people know, if you've watched the John Campion show or my own show, Rob Observations, for any length of time, um, I have a problem with the Marvel Cinematic Universe's cosmology. I, I don't understand who's in charge of whom. You know, uh, uh, what's going on? And like you said, we've seen so few of the Norse gods. Where are the rest of them? <laughs> We got Thor and Loki, you know, who do we, who else is there? And I think that's a really legit question. And it also, it also speaks to the fact that what is the hierarchy of gods in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? I mean, they showed us a few celestials and Thor, but Arshem the judge, is he going to come back and judge humanity? Like, where are we at here? And I, I don't know the answer. And I, I really do think that the Marvel Cinematic Universe needs to explain themselves we need to understand what is the cosmology of the universe i think it's really important that we learn this because it's um uh if we don't how are we supposed to understand the machinations of what's happening um and i i think that we need that across the board with everybody i mean whether it's the celestials with does anybody preside i mean eternity is just eternity but you know he was depicted as a well he it they whatever was depicted as an entity and i kind of like the way eternity was depicted in love and thunder but again does anybody preside over eternity like are there rules that <laughs> i don't know i think we need to know though mm. man lemonade sometimes is good um i i don't know and i think we need to know the answer to this and I think it's a really good question you're asking, but I don't have answers for you. But it is the one thing I, I – maybe somebody should write a book, The Cosmology of the MCU, and explain which gods are related to which gods, who has, who has, who has dominion over whom. I don't know, man. I need to know. Good questions, though. And now let's hear from one of our sponsors for today's mailbag, Harry's. One of the great joys in any man's life is his morning shaving ritual, and no one gives you better tools for that ritual than Harry's. The Harry's starter set is all you need to give you the best shave possible. That foaming shave gel on your cheeks, the feel of that razor in your hand, the newly designed handle and how it looks and feels even better than the original. Harry's is giving their best offer to viewers of the John Campia Show. First time Harry's customers can redeem a starter set for just $3 at harrys.com backslash slash Campia. That includes a five-blade cartridge, a weighted handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel cover to protect your blades on the go. A $13 value, all for just $3. Harry's gives you simple quality craftsmanship at a fair price, and they'll never overcharge you for gimmicks you don't need. Harry's blades hold up better than ever. Guys who've tried it said their eighth shave is as sharp as their first, and their newly designed weighted handle 
looks almost as fresh as you'll feel after using it. Harry's has the highest customer satisfaction in the shaving industry, and they're still offering a no-risk trial. Don't like your shave? No worries. It's on them. New look, same incredible offer. There's really never been a better time to give Harry's a try. Just go to harrys.com backslash campia today to get your starter set for just $3. That's harrys.com backslash campia. Man, I got to get me some of that Harry's because I'm getting too hairy myself. Chloe Fanning sends in a tip and says, Before internet challenges, I remember a James Caan movie, The Program, where a scene in the movie had to be removed when some teens tried to replicate a scene by laying down in the road and letting cars pass over them, ultimately being fatal to one of them. You know what, Chloe? That's funny. I, I haven't thought about that. I remember the program. I, I can absolutely imagine that that was true. Um, first of all, I would never trust anyone unless they were, even if they were stunt drivers, to do that. But, um, you know, it shows that stupidity existed before the internet. <laughs> Teen stupidity. Um, but I remember, I, I remember that now I'm on, I want to go look that up, but, uh, it was, a, the program was like a football movie or it was a sports movie or, or, or I, I vaguely, I saw it once. I, I don't remember anything about it. Now I have to go look it up, but I believe that's absolutely true. The 16 part message Greg sends in a tip and says, fear not agents of shield fans. Kamala being a mutant does not erase the established Inhumans Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. lore from the main timeline of the MCU. We still canon, baby, and not vomit, John. Um, look, I mean, uh, again, I I think that um, I, I do not feel the way that John felt that this, this is like the first entrance of a mutant in the MCU. There's been mutants. And if you go by the lore, I mean, you know, Apocalypse... And Sabanur was in Egypt. I just think that they haven't been revealed in the main MCU timeline. I think they're still around. They're just, they're just, they haven't revealed themselves. Um, but it's funny. But would you want though the Agents of Shield? Would you want that show to be entirely? Mm, would you? But you know, I, I look. A lot of people like Agents of Shield. I like some of it. Um, but I. Uh, uh, I <laughs> I don't know how they're going to... I think that, look, Black Bolt, we did. We, we now have the Inhumans are in some part of the multiverse because we saw Black Bolt. Uh, I like the Inhumans a lot. So hopefully, maybe they will show up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Who's to say? Um, huh? Tipped $5. So the X-Men theme misdirect isn't fine, but Ralph Boner is? Huh? Yeah, man, I... I know. I still, I still don't buy that whole Ralph Boner thing. That just doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. We're watching somebody from the X Men universe, and it was the same actor. It was very odd. I, I still, I didn't like that at all. I, I maintain that that really was Quicksilver or a different entity, sorcery, whatever. We we haven't heard the last of that yet. I don't think. I don't think. <laughs> That's funny though. Uh, Chad Burney says, with all the coming-of-age tropes in this show, the ones I really liked were, I guess you're talking about Miss Marvel, among many other things, your dad gives you your name, i.e. Miss Marvel, and your mom makes you ready to present to the world, i.e. the costume. Stuck the landing. Bring on the filthy. Chad, Chad Bernie, you're correct. I thought that was delightful. I mean, I, you know, the show really warmed the cockles in this old man's heart. And I, I really liked, I really thought they did a wonderful job. And what I really liked was the family was a genuinely good family. They didn't reveal like some so-and-so's cheating on so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so embezzled money and all this kind of craziness. Um, I, I, I thought it was absolutely delightful, and I loved the mother-father tag team to create Miss Marvel. I thought that was great and perfect, and more, more than that, it was perfect for the story they were telling in that show. And I, I completely agree with you, 100%. Asad Khan says, I'm a Pakistani-American and huge MCU fan, so I cried a lot during the show. Never knew how good it felt to have your story on screen in a positive light. Love you, John, longtime listener, and you helped ignite my love for film and stories 10-plus years ago. Well, Asad, I'm with you 100%. You know, I mean, I, I have been critical at times of, um, you know, of, of extremism in, in all, all of its shapes and sizes and... Uh, 
Uh, one of the great things, though, is that that's just it's just that it's, it's extremism. And, you know, the Muslim uh, population is I'm Jewish myself. There's only 20 million Jews in the world, but there's over there's a, over a billion Muslims in the world. And I think that Muslim culture, which has a rich history. I mean, we got algebra from from Islam, Islam Islamic culture um, and science. And so much of our, our history is rooted in um Muslim culture and to see to see it represented in such a positive light and a warm light and as John was saying you know what was so great about it is you see that yes while you're seeing the the specificity of a Pakistani um, American family and the uh, and they're all Muslims uh, it was such a you those that that family was all of our families as John said and it was wonderful and I really liked I mean, I don't, everyone has told me how authentic it is, but I, I like, I wish those people were my family. <laughs> and I thought it was great. And it was, what I loved is seeing a family that functions like a family. We are so used to seeing families that don't work, broken homes, parents that hate each other, children of divorce. What a refreshing thing to have a family that was loving and goofy and funny and and yet they were there for you and there for one another. It was great. And seeing a mom and dad that really loved each other and loved their family, I, I loved it. I just thought it was great. So, Assad, I'm glad to feel that I've heard from other people. You know, other friends of mine, like Kamran Pasha, talked about every every week he would write these screeds on uh, Facebook about how great it was to see this kind of representation. And I think that's what we need more of. And when people talk about representation, that's what they mean, you know. And I think that was really good. I'm glad that it worked. Garden Variety Vagabond says, John, am I the only one who you have heard from... Hang on a second, wait a second. John, am I the only one who you have heard from... Oh, John, am I the only one who you have heard from that says that they do not hear the guitar sound after the revelation in Miss Marvel? I've replayed it multiple times with headphones on. Am I alone? <laughs> I still think Inhumans is still an option. I'm with you, dude. I mean, I heard it, but I don't know. I don't. I just don't think even the revelation when they bring up the word mutants, it doesn't mean anything. Where I think there's a lot. There's a lot. There's too much. Too much being read into it. Garden Variety Vagabond, and I'm, I am with you, a hundred percent on this. I don't think this means what everybody uh, says it's going to. What they say it means. I just. I don't buy it. I don't know. I don't buy it. I just don't buy it. Uh, Anime Dimension says, hello, John. I love your show. Well, I'm I'm sorry, John's not here. Uh, I heard you say that Bruno saying mutation with the X-Men theme is a reference to X-Men, but what if it is misdirection because Bruno is a teenager? He doesn't know the difference between X-Men and Inhumans, and him saying muta mutation makes sense. Anime Dimension, you and I, we park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. I, that's kind of the way I thought about it, you know. I didn't, I didn't see it as, I didn't see it as what everybody seems to be saying. And certainly, I think I, I didn't, I didn't like. Oh my God, it's mutants! I didn't see it like that. I, he was using the word mutant or mutation the way anybody would, um, because if you know mutants haven't revealed themselves. And remember, the mutants in the Marvel Cinematic Universe are genetically different than human beings. They were born genetically different, or they're manif it, it, they're Homo superior instead of Homo sapiens, and at least that's what they call in the comics. So, um, yeah, man, um, and it's it's uh, I just I don't buy this whole. It's the first time we see a mutant. I don't I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Um, Garden Variety Vagabond says, John, that was not Carol Danvers. That was Kamala. Her powers in the comics, she can change form, and her first form was Carol Danvers, her hero. Ooh. You know what? You might be right about that. You might be right about that, and that's why, I mean, I, I was thinking that she was pulled somewhere because she gets pulled into the... But if she just transformed, I think they would have done it differently. But you know what? I'll buy that. I'll buy that. I think... You know what? I'm going to go back because they have changed her powers in the show as opposed to the comics. That was a big deal. 
But you might be right. Interesting. Um, could be. Could be. I. You know what? I'm going to put a pin in that, uh, and we'll have to see in Marvel's. Well, we're going to find out. Um, that you could very well be correct. And you know what? Now that I think about it, the outfit that she was wearing did not look like her powered up armor, whatever that was going on. It looked different. And it looked, that's why her arms were bare and stuff like that. It, you, you know what? You know what? I'm Now that I'm thinking about it and playing that again, and I'm thinking about when we did the after show, I think you're right. I think you're right. That wasn't Carol Danvers. She just turned, you know what? Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Garden Variety Vagabond, here's to you, sir. Uh, this is fine Minute Maid lemonade. And I'm going to drink some just for you. I probably shouldn't. There's probably so much sugar in this. But it's good. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, man. Okay. D.A. Reuse Movie Guy. Or is it Reuse? D.A. Reuse Movie Guy says, Hello, John and crew. In an observation in Ragnarok, Odin's final message to Thor was, Are you the god of hammers? It was <laughs> it was to channel his power. It was never his true strength. So in Love and Thunder, channeling his true power to kids was possible. Thoughts? Hmm. Okay, let's say uh, in for a penny, in for a pound. Let's say I buy that. The problem that I have with that is it was vaguely, I mean, the, you offer a, a, a good explanation, but it's 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 something that the way it was presented in the film and the way it was done, it's really out of left field, and we haven't seen anything remotely similar to that established in um, in the movies before. So the question that, I ask is, um, was that, it, it, are you playing fast and loose with the audience's expectations? I, I just, you know, I don't, I, I just don't know if I buy it. I don't know if I buy it. Um, so yeah, I, although it's, it's not a, it's not a bad theory though. It's not a bad theory, but it just, if that's the case, they did a really bad job of establishing it in, in the, um, in the film itself. JJ the Sith Plane sends in a tip and says, My theory is the Ten Rings and Kamala's bangles are in fact alien technology, but not for the externals or celestials to come, but a beacon or a heartbeat of apocalypse and a way to wake him up, which is why it's so old and somehow woken Kamala's X gene. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, it could be. I mean, obviously, uh, we haven't seen any mutants so far, and but I like that theory, but, 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 you know, I, I mean, who would say that the bangle hadn't been being used? So the bangle, I don't think whoever created it would have thought it would not get used. So that it's, that it's a beacon. I don't know about that. Um, but it's an interesting theory. The JJ goes on to say, which is why I think it makes sense as to why Kang is the villain for Ant-Man and not for the whole MCU which he'll introduce on the fact that he was a pharaoh during the time Apocalypse was around before his slumber. Yeah, yeah, uh, Ramatep, right? And uh, I, you know what? Very well could be. Very well could be. I mean, I, it would kind of be cool going into the past, the quantum realm or whatever. That's um, That's not bad. I like that. But I think it's too much. The Marvel Cinematic Universe tends to keep things relatively simple, too. So, But we'll see. We'll see. Garden Variety Vagabond goes on to say, Some notes on the new Monsters movie. Ooh, I watched that trailer. I showed that trailer this morning to Elizabeth. And she's like, what is this? Uh, some notes on the new Monsters movie. The cast stars Rob Zombie's wife as Lily. The two kids, Eddie and Marilyn, from the original Monsters. A former Doctor Who. A Bond girl. And Hurley from Lost. Yeah, that's cool, but Garden Variety Vagabond, it doesn't look good. Uh, it looks like a parody, and I don't, I don't know why. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not sold. I don't even know if I'm going to be sold. I don't. Need, it's going to take a lot for me to, I think, sit down and watch that. Uh, uh, Yumi uh, says Ari Kamran's power. I interpreted them as being an effect of his mom closing the rift in the veil. Kamala reminds her of Kamran, and then the mom says, you're right, 
There is only one way I can close it. Then she steps in, says his name, and the veil closes, even though it didn't close when the first person went into it. I assume she had some way to contain the rift within Comron, which also explains his trouble to control the powers and why the VFX on the two have similar colors. Hmm. Maybe, but, but okay. Again, these are great theories everybody's presenting today. I could buy that, but the problem is, so she wasn't in any proximity to what his mother was doing, and it just... It, for that power to seek him out requires there has to be some kind of intelligence behind it. Like, how 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 was, was it able to find him? And I mean, I don't I don't think it's a bad theory. I just I just don't know if I can buy into that. It just seems it's a little cumbersome and a, a, a little too implausible for me. But yeah, I don't know. That's hmm. I don't think, but see, the thing is, they were trying to get home, but they really didn't know, like, your theory means that she would understand how all these powers kind of work, and I don't think she really did. Uh, I think it was like a guess, and it just happened to work out, but you, you could be right. I mean, again, these are questions I, I felt frustrated that they didn't answer. I don't know if we'll ever get an answer for them, but I like the theories. You guys are uh, you guys are throwing out some very compelling theories and explanations today, and I'm I'm here for it. Hayden Burke says, DC is sitting on a gold mine. Take the Justice League cast with their individual successes today. Momoa, Gadot, Cavill, etc. Add Levi, Senna, The Rock, bring back Ryan Reynolds, Red Notice Reunion, and my God, that ensemble rivals the best MCU ensemble. Hayden, you're not wrong. I, I, I Look, people make fun of the Green Lantern movie a lot, and I think the problem with the Green Lantern movie is, again, it was a tonal issue. Like, I love the stuff on Oa. I love seeing the Guardians. I love seeing um, uh, a lot of what went on there. And I like Kilowog and his training. And I think Green Lantern was half of a good movie. And I even like Ryan Reynolds a lot as Hal Jordan. I think they could bring him back and redeem that character. The same way they redeemed, you know, Wolverine in The Wolverine compared to X-Men Origins Wolverine. I think you could absolutely do that. And I think that's a great point. And also... You know, while I didn't like Wonder Woman 84 at all, I loved the first Wonder Woman, and Jason Momoa was in a billion-dollar grossing movie. And John Cena and and uh, um, uh, um, The Rock and Zachary Levi, the entire Shazam pantheon, the, the Marvel family, great stuff there. And I think that they absolutely could, um, they're absolutely worthy of of putting them all together. I would love to see that. I think it's a great idea. I don't think it'll happen. They're trying to figure out. I mean, if 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 Black Light and Black Lightning, if Black Adam is great and the next Shazam and Fury of the Gods is great, if those two movies are great, maybe they could start because there's no there's nothing to say that they can't come together again and do a new Justice League movie once these characters are established. Because what they're doing is they're making these individual uh, solo movies successful, which is what they should have done in the first place. So I I I don't think you're wrong. It's just, it's a big proposition, and it's tough. It's going to be hard to make that all work. And now let's hear for our last sponsor for today's mailbag, the folks at Athletic Greens. Hey, guys, we want to take a second to thank the sponsor of this video, Athletic Greens. Now, when you get really busy, and you guys know that Ann and I are really busy, one of the first things that you sacrifice is eating healthy. And you know, I simply have never eaten enough vegetables in my diet, I admit it. So for a long time, I've been looking for a really good all-in-one supplement that helps me get those nutrients and vitamins that my body needs. And thank goodness, I found Athletic Greens AG1. So what is Athletic Greens AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods and probiotics to help you start your day right. And for me and Ann, it's easy. We get up in the morning, we pour a big glass of water and add one scoop of AG1. So many people today are taking some kind of multivitamin and it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. And it's cheaper than getting all those different supplements yourself. And on top of giving you all those vitamins and nutrients, it also supports better sleep and quality of recovery and supports mental clarity and alertness. Right Right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. 
It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash mailbag. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash mailbag to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Man, I'm not a big vegetable guy, but Athletic Greens, that is the place where you can get juiced up. And I don't know, I feel like I'm really much fitter when I use Athletic Greens. Hayden Burke with another question. I don't think Fantastic Beasts 4 will happen. Each film has seen a decline in numbers. Salaries will only increase with his next with this next film, making it more expensive. Heck, demand isn't there. I doubt the last one even made money. I think Beasts is extinct. Well, here's the thing. that The franchise itself is valuable, but you might abs- absolutely be right about this because the Fantastic Beasts was not a wildly successful movie. And I can absolutely see that um, them not making another film. And they've had three. I mean, trilogies are a good place to end things. I know they, they said there was going to be five Fantastic Beasts movies, but, you know, some franchises... When they made the James Bond movie License to Kill, it underperformed in 1989, but they came back and they made another one, and, well, it was five years later, or six years later with GoldenEye, but they still made another one. So we'll see, but you're not wrong. That assessment is not wrong. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't make another Fantastic Beast movie, because everything you said is absolutely true. Chaos Witch says, Hi, John and or Rob. I love the show. I have a theory about the Noor Dimension. If Kamala's bangles truly are the nega bands and that Carol and Kamala have swapped places, wouldn't it be cool if the Noor dimension is actually a part of the negative zone? Hmm, I like that. We're getting deep into Marvel Comics lore. Could be. I mean, I don't know. I You know, it's funny. I, I think whenever I'm thinking about the, the MCU, I always think, I always take the simplest explanation because they have to make it palatable for general audiences, but you never know. Um, that's, that's actually kind of a cool idea. I, I like that. Um, I think that's cool. And it looks like Chaos Witch goes on to say, the Fantastic Four, I love this idea. I, I thought about this. I love this idea of uh, Chaos Witch. The Fantastic Four could have been stuck there since the 60s due to the failed quantum realm experiments and how they got their powers. Now that the Celestials are established, a Nihilist could be a Celestial stuck in the negative zone after the multiversal war mentioned in Loki Season 1. Cast Witch, I like the way you think. Here's the thing, though. Again, uh, while all of that is deep Marvel Comics lore that you're you're, you're touching on, and that I think that's a, those are great ideas. I'm like, yeah, I'm for that. <laughs> I do that. But the problem is you have to ask yourself, how within the narrative structure of a movie, like in two hours or whatever, how could they explain that to the normies in the audience that weren't steeped in Marvel lore? That that's why a lot of a lot of fan theories sometimes, and myself included, especially when I'm thinking about Star Trek lore, I get so caught up like, what if this would have been, wouldn't it be cool if and, and it would be, but when you're talking about such deep, deep, deep cut lore, um Sometimes it's like, well, okay, um, can we can we do that? Uh, how do you explain that to the audience? But I like I like where you're coming from. Oh, and Chaos Witch goes on. Galactus could also be in the negative zone after being imprisoned there during the war. That war could have been between the Celestials and Galactus when he emerged after the seventh Cosmos in the current MCU, along with the Celestials, along when the Celestials came about. I think. Um, well, <laughs> Chaos Witch goes on. Let's go. Let's keep going. Uh, the Ten Rings could belong to Galactus, who made them at his planet Ta before the death of his cosmos, the sixth reincarnation of the cosmos, and he became Galactus. Explains why no one recognizes the energy signatures. They're older than the current cosmos. Wow. And that's why there are host planets. Not to help universes grow, um, but to increase the celestials' numbers. Arashem has been known to lie already. This is just how it all connects in my head, and I could be wrong, of course, but it's fun to theorize. Well, first of all, Chaos Witch, I got to give you a clap, clap for that, because that all, all of that, all of what you said w- shows a deep knowledge and respect for Marvel Comics lore, and I really like what you're saying. 
I have to reject most of what you said for the various reasons that I just illustrated. I just think that it's you're asking you'd have to explain all that. And if you let's say we let's just take take what I just read that you sent and let's make that imagine that was a um a mid movie montage that explained all this stuff. So we got this mid movie montage of all this this stuff that you just described happening. Um I think that's it's it's it would be just too hard to explain. It's too much information for people to accept. Now, if you could parcel something like that out um, over the course of a couple movies, maybe, but it's still deep, deep lore. And the problem is, the question you should ask yourself, whenever, I, I, actually, I think this is great, when when any, any fans who know lore, whether it's Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or Star Trek or Doctor Who or now the MCU or the DCEU, um, you have to ask yourself, how do you explain all of this in a movie? How do you make it palatable for the audience? Like, what kind of a scene would explain it? You can't just, you can never have somebody sitting around going, well, you know what's happened. It's the negative zone. And just, there was a war and the Galactus and the reincarnation. And people tune out. Um, there's, there is one scene, however, that you can always go back to, which is the greatest exposition scene in any movie ever. And it, it shouldn't work, but it does. And it's in Raiders of the Lost Ark when the two government officials come and Indiana brings his Bible and explain, they talk about Abner Ravenwood and they explain the whole plot of the movie and what's going on and why the Ark is dangerous. And, oh, there's a picture of it right here. I mean, yeah, it, that, that any screenwriting course would tell you you can never write a scene like that. And of course, you can always point to Raiders and go, well, there's a scene. And that I can, I can see, I can see like a Harrison Ford like scene when everything that you just wrote down was explained away in a scene like that. And somebody has a book and they're showing you, although it only worked once well. <laughs> so I don't know if it could be done, but I really do appreciate um, that's very creative, imaginative, and I, I, I like it. I'm there for you, buddy. And uh, <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't object if that was the way things went. Well, everyone, that brings me to the end of the mailbag. I want to thank our sponsors, Harry's and Athletic Greens. But most of all, I want to thank you guys for writing in great questions, really interesting topics. This was kind of a very interesting show filled with theories, which I really like because I'm a geek. So anyway, again, I want to thank you all for supporting the channel, the John Campy Show channel, the way you do. If uh, you just are watching this for the first time and think about sending us uh, a letter you'd like read here on the mailbag. The link is right down there. Of course, I am Robert Meyer Burnett. You can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett. Find me on Twitter at Burnett RM. Or find me on my own YouTube channel, Post Geek Singularity, or the website, postgeeksingularity.com. A lot of great interaction and stuff on that website. Check it out. And I guess that brings me to the end of the mailbag for Thursday, July 14th, 2022. Remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do, listen. And with that, I say once again, thank you all for supporting the channel and making my job fun. I love doing these mailbags. <laughs>